Well, welcome to this session on the Protestant Reformation. This will be a session in which we continue to talk about the Renaissance and how the Renaissance developed, especially in Northern Europe. So let's begin to talk about how the Protestant Reformation arose. The Protestant Reformation marked a major shift both in Christianity and in Western civilization as a whole. During the 1500s, several groups managed to break away from the Roman Catholic Church. This had not been possible before. In the previous couple of centuries, there had been groups that had attempted to separate themselves from the Roman Catholic Church, and those groups had ultimately failed, either because they just ran out of steam or because the Catholic Church put a stop to it. The causes of this new freedom to break away from the Catholic Church as the single church in the in Western Christianity included the rise of nationalism in Europe. People began to think of themselves and pride themselves more uh, on a national basis, like I'm French or I'm English or I'm Spanish, rather than I'm you know subject of Duke so-and-so or Baron so-and-so, and so my loyalty on the local level is is to a much smaller region, and I'm a Catholic, so you know my loyalty in the bigger sense lies with with the bigger picture of Catholicism. But there was also corruption in the Roman Catholic Church, which bothered a lot of people, obviously, and this corruption was well known. There was a desire for vernacular Bible translations, that is, translations into people's native everyday language instead of having to have it read in Latin, which they didn't understand. And remember that the Bible was originally in Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament, but it had early on been translated into the language that many people in the West spoke, which was Latin. So by the 1500s, it was the Latin version of the Bible that people were hearing, and most of them couldn't understand that because they were now speaking French or English or Spanish or some other language. And there was educational enlightenment. In other words, more people were becoming educated. So let's talk about nationalism. Just as an example of nationalism, this is King Philip IV of France, known as Philippe le Bel or Philip the Beautiful. Um, they said that he had such a beautiful face. It was more beautiful than some women's face. And uh, he and the Pope were having an argument over the taxation of Catholic property in France. For most of the Middle Ages, Catholic property had been off limits in terms of taxation. But there was a war going on with the English that Philip needed money for, so he decided to impose a small tax on Catholic property. And the Pope said, absolutely not. You will not do that. I will excommunicate you if you do, meaning I will cut you off from the sacraments. And instead of backing down, Philip simply sent French troops to arrest the Pope and put him in prison. Well, Boniface was in prison for just a short time, I think only a couple of weeks, when Italian troops managed to overpower the French troops and free the Pope, who died soon after, just, I think, of shock after the experience. And then Philip, instead of giving up, simply appointed one of the Catholic cardinals in France as the new Pope. And so for a while after this, there was a split papacy, which I think we covered in the late Middle Ages. And it was, uh, it was a pope in Avignon, France, and another pope in Rome, which didn't really work out. Catholic people wondered who to obey. Who do you look to? Who do you respect? The one in France or the one in Rome? And Philip basically decided he didn't need the pope. He could control the pope, and that's what he decided to do. Then there was corruption in the Catholic Church, which I mentioned before. We had already talked about Desiderius Erasmus uh, at the end of the Renaissance. He was a Dutch priest and scholar who criticized the abuses of the church while never leaving it. He always believed that the Catholic Church was the true church. It just had gotten off track. He also pieced together something very close to the original Greek New Testament by um, finding or by putting together old manuscripts that, that were existing in you know, places like Jerusalem and you know, Cairo and places like that where they had been for ages. He was able to provide a fresh starting ground for the translation of, of the Bible into other languages. And 
Scholars didn't have to work with the Latin translation. They could go back to the original Greek of the New Testament. He also sympathized with Luther's criticisms when Luther got started, but he remained loyal to the Catholic Church. And vernacular Bible translation was another factor I mentioned. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about this, but John Hus or Jan Hus was a Czech Catholic priest in Prague. We would now uh, call it Czech, but in those days it was called Bohemia. And Hus was a powerful preacher. He had broken away from the Catholic Church in the 1400s, but he was eventually arrested and executed by the Catholic Church for his supposed heresies or his disagreements with, with the church and its policies. But he had a group of followers who basically went underground and never went back to the Catholic Church. They were called the Bohemian Brethren or the United Brethren, the Unitas Fratrum. They weren't really a successful Protestant group because they weren't public. They were meeting in cellars and caves and in the countryside. So they were a, an underground group, but they were what we call proto-Protestants. Then also in the 1300s, John Wycliffe was an Englishman who translated the Bible into the English of the day. And then William Tyndall, who right around the time of the 1500s, um, updated the English Bible to fit the English that was being spoken at that time. And English was going through major changes at the time. From the 1300s to about the 1600s, there were some major shifts in the way words were pronounced and the way the vocabulary was arranged and so forth. So it needed a, an update. And then education and enlightenment. This was the time of the late Middle Ages when the great universities were established. And so a lot more people were getting educated and people were thinking, well, I'm more educated than my priest. Why should I have to go to him to understand the Bible if I could just read it myself? then I would be able to probably do a better job of understanding what God wants me to do than the priest does. And so there was this, this growing feeling of, you know, I, I need to have access myself and I need to make my own decisions and not just accept what people tell me. So the protest movement that eventually succeeded in breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church can be divided into four main branches. I've already mentioned the Unitas Fratrum that Jan Hus and his followers began. Again, that was not a successful Protestant movement because it was underground and persecuted and never really um, amounted to anything for quite a long time. But it showed that people could survive outside the Catholic Church in terms of their Christianity. But the four main groups that were successful were Lutheranism, the Reformed churches, Anglicanism, and a, kind of a hodgepodge or grab bag group, grab bag group called the Radicals with the main group that, that was successful from this um, category of the radicals would be the Anabaptists. Let's start with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was uh, a law school student. His father had risen from being a mine worker to a mine owner. He was absolutely determined that his son should get an education and be a very wealthy, prosperous, and prominent man. But on the way home from law school, during a break, Martin Luther was caught in a thunderstorm, and in terror of his life, he vowed to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors, that he would become a monk if St. Anne would save his life in the midst of this terrifying thunderstorm. He was spared in the thunderstorm, and he did fulfill his vow to become a monk. As a monk, he decided to take it very seriously, and he was troubled by his personal sin. I don't know that he was any worse than any other young man at the time, <clears throat> but he took it very seriously, and he, um, he would sit in confession for a long time, trying to think up every sin or every possible sin he might have committed, and eventually his people who, you know, the, the priest he was confessing to just basically said, you're wasting my time. You haven't committed all these sins. You... you think you might have, or you know, you might have a tempting thought, but a tempting thought is not a sin. So he was, he was told that he was taking it all way too seriously. His superior, Johann von Staupitz, who was the head of the monastery, decided to get his mind off his troubles, especially after a certain incident when Luther wouldn't come out of his room that he was staying in, uh, Staupitz visited him, asked him what was wrong. He said, I hate God. He said, what do you mean you hate God? You're a monk. You don't hate God. 
And he said, yes, I do. And he said, well, look up, you know, look up at that. What's that on your wall? There was only one thing on the wall. It was a crucifix. Who's that on that, on that cross up there? Well, that's Jesus. And what, what is Jesus doing on that cross? Well, he's dying for the sins of the world. Okay, and that, that includes your sins, right, Brother Martin? Yes. So you must love the God who died for your sins. No, I hate him. Why would you possibly hate him? Because he's going to send me to hell. Because I've committed too many sins and I'm not repentant enough. And, you know, and it was all this self-doubt. And stop it said, that's, that's just nonsense. The whole reason Jesus came was to die for the sins of the world, including yours. And to get his mind off his trouble, he sent him off to the university to get his doctorate. They needed an educated uh, monk. They also needed a priest uh, in, that would be in the monastery. And so he was sent off to get his doctorate, and then he was ordained a priest. When he returned, he got a job in the brand new University of Wittenberg. The University of Wittenberg was uh, the project of the Duke of Saxony, Duke Frederick, who was very proud of it. And they needed teachers, and here's a young man from the area who just got his doctorate, and he's a priest, and so they put him to work teaching the Book of Romans at this new university. Well, he had a sudden insight when he was meditating on the very first chapter of Romans. Now, I should tell you that Martin Luther had a problem with constipation. He spent long hours sitting on the toilet waiting for something to happen, and so he would meditate on the scripture during this time. And one of the scriptures he meditated on was Romans 1.17, which says, the just shall live by faith. And he thought, what in the world does the just shall live by faith? What does that mean? And it seemed to him after pondering it, that it meant that God would save people by their faith, that they, the, the way that people would live or would have eternal life would be by their faith and not by going through religious ceremonies, not by participating in all kinds of sacraments and buying all sorts of indulgences and lighting candles and saying prayers. It was simply faith in Jesus. That was one issue. The other issue was he was so angered by the selling of indulgences by the Vatican. The Vatican was going throughout Germany and other parts of Europe selling forgiveness. For a certain amount of money, you'd get a certificate that would give you a certain number of years out of purgatory. And you could buy one for yourself, you could buy one for a loved one. And, uh, and the Catholic Church was using that money to finance its big building project of the time, which of course was St. Peter's uh, Cathedral in Rome, the same one that Michelangelo was, uh, was finishing up as the architect. So this was this was the project, selling of indulgences to pay for church programs and to finance church projects. Martin Luther decided that somebody needed to do something about this problem. So he decided to publish his findings as he studied the Bible. He found what he considered to be 95 issues with what the Catholic Church was practicing and teaching at the time. They were called the 95 Theses, the 95 Points. And according to legend, he marched up to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral and nailed them to the door, inviting public debate. Well, he debated some of the local Catholic scholars, and because he was such a great debater, having been to law school, he tended to carry his points and convince a lot of people, and his fame was growing throughout Saxony, which is that northern part of Germany. Eventually, he is called to a different area of, of what is now Germany. He was called to Worms. He was called by a very high Catholic official to appear before him. And Martin Luther went to this official and was excited about it. He was said, I finally get to talk to somebody important, somebody with an education, and uh, so we can we can debate these matters and discuss these matters. The official said, wait a second, Dr. Luther, you're not here to debate or, or make your points. You're here to renounce your views that are objectionable to the Catholic Church. And Luther said, what do you mean I'm, I'm here to renounce my views? He said, you're here to repent, otherwise you'll be excommunicated. And Luther said he could not do that. He said it goes against conscience. I can't violate my conscience. I believe this is true. If I 
if I go against what I've said, then I'm violating my own beliefs as to what I think is true about God and the Bible. And so he refused to renounce his faith. They didn't quite know what to do with him. 150 years earlier, they executed people like Martin Luther, but the Renaissance had made differences of opinion much more acceptable, and there was enough antagonism by local rulers against the Vatican and its abuses, especially the selling of indulgences and the appointing of bishops that really weren't qualified and you know, just imposing all sorts of rules and regulations that the Catholic Church did not have nearly as much power. So they didn't know what to do with him. They sent him back home until they could decide what his fate would be. On the way home, he was kidnapped, but it wasn't by his enemies. It was by the friendly Duke Frederick of Saxony, who hid him in the Wartburg Castle for a whole year. And Martin Luther was able in that year to translate the New Testament into the German of the time, so the German of the 1500s. He was eventually excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, and seeing no alternative, seeing that the Church did not wish to be reformed, did not wish to make any changes, he believed his only option was to start an independent Christian movement, which became known as Lutheranism. I don't think Luther would have wanted it named after him, but that's what his followers called it. He was the visionary, and his protege, Philip Melanchthon, was actually the organizer. So between Luther and Melanchthon, the Lutheran movement is established. Luther admitted students to be trained as his leadership. He also admitted former monks and nuns who were leaving Catholicism and needed the place to go. He would retrain them and uh, send them out to become pastors in the Lutheran movement. And he formed the first Christian dating service because if he believed in the married pastor. And so he believed that, that if, if you're not married, how can you understand the common problems that people go through? So he believed that it would be ideal for pastors to be married. And so he would take these former priests and monks and marry them with former nuns and send them out as couples to lead his new churches. Key beliefs of the Lutheran movement include sola fide, which is faith alone. Faith in Jesus alone is the means of salvation. You're saved because you believe in Jesus, and that's it. You're saved by grace alone, sola gracia, meaning not because you've earned it, but because God is gracious. God wants to save you, and he's provided the way through Jesus. Sola scriptura means only scripture, that, that the final authority for Lutherans and for all Protestants, really, is the Bible. It's not the Bible plus what the Pope says. It's not the Bible plus what church councils have said. It's simply the Bible. The pastor should be married. It's best if the pastor is married. And normal living is sanctified. In other words, to be a true and authentic Christian, you don't have to be a monk or a nun or a priest. You can, you can be a normal person living a normal life and be an authentic Christian. The emphasis of Lutheranism, it would be faith in Christ alone for salvation. Lutheranism was an outlaw religion for a number of years until the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. So really from about 1520, when Martin Luther um, nailed his theses to the door of the cathedral, to 1555, that's 35 years, it was an outlaw religion. But eventually, European leaders realized, you know, you can't kill that many people. Most of central and northern Germany became Lutheran. Uh, all the Scandinavian countries like Denmark and Norway and Sweden and Finland became Lutheran. Estonia uh, became Lutheran. And so you can't kill everybody in those regions. And so therefore, you, uh, you have to legalize it. And so that's what they did. They made the Peace of Augsburg in which Lutheranism was legal in that region wasn't legal everywhere. And, and so the principle was whatever the prince was, whatever the ruler of the area was, whether it was the king or a duke or somebody like that, then the people in that area also had to be of that same religion. The people had to be the same religion that the ruler was, which caused the great Protestant migrations. Um, so there were, there were lots of Catholic people in those regions that didn't want to be Lutheran, 
and so they would have to migrate to Catholic regions. So, so there were lots of Catholics in northern Germany that had to migrate south to southern Germany, which stayed Catholic, Bavarian, places like that. Plenty of Protestants in those southern German areas that migrated north. So it was a time of great movement of people. Now let's move on to the Reformed churches. The Reformed churches got their beginning, oh, probably about, uh, well, 12 years or so after Martin Luther started his movement in Germany. It was started by Jean Chavin, or John Calvin, as we would pronounce it in English, who was a university student, a law student, at the University of Paris. Obviously, people were talking about the Lutheran movement all over Europe. It was well liked by many young people. It was also despised by others. So there was this great debate going on about whether the Lutherans were good or not good. And John Calvin decided he would look into it himself. And after some study, decided that Martin Luther was mainly right. But he had some issues with Martin Luther, and he decided that he was going to go and correct Dr. Luther himself, you know, the, the brash young man, very self-assured. So he was on his way to Germany when his friends stopped him and said, no, you, you've become a wanted person. You've been too outspoken in your faith. So uh, they're looking for you. They're watching the roads for you. So you, you don't go east into Germany. So he went south into Switzerland first, and then he was going to travel over and then go north into Germany. Switzerland is one of those funny countries that has three different languages that are official. Most of Switzerland speaks a dialect of German, Swiss German. There's a tiny part by Italy that speaks Italian, and then there's a part by France that speaks French. And Calvin went to the French part, Genève or Geneva. In Geneva, he assumed leadership of a brand new Protestant movement. They had, they had decided that they didn't want Catholicism, so they had more or less gotten rid of the Catholic Church in Geneva, and they needed a leader. And along comes this young French-speaking Protestant that was very educated and very passionate. Seemed like he was directly sent by God, so they asked him to stay, and for the most part, he stayed the rest of his life in Geneva, organizing this new Protestant movement that wasn't quite on board with Lutheranism, and it was called the Reformed Church. The Reformed Church not only wanted to reform Christian practice and Christian worship, but they wanted to reform society as well. So Luther didn't mess with the government, didn't mess with the way society did things. It was just the church. Calvin wanted to do both. And so the government was reformed. They formed a republic, which was something that the Romans had done, and the fact that we in the United States have a republic form of government, we really owe not just to the Romans, but especially to John Calvin, because Calvin revived the idea. And in Geneva, he trained young leaders for the growing international Reformed Church movement. He sent young men out all over Europe to form these new churches. These new churches were started in the Netherlands, which became the Dutch Reformed Church. It came to America when the Dutch settlers came over here. In the United States, it's known as the Christian Reformed Church. In Germany, it's known as the German Reformed Church. In South Africa, it's known as the Dutch Reformed Church because of the Dutch people that settled there. In Scotland, it wasn't called Reformed, it was called Presbyterian, but it's the same movement. In France, it was known as the French Reformed Church, and the people who followed it were known as Huguenot. I know the word looks like Huguenots, but it's Huguenot. The Huguenot may have eventually made up about one-fifth of the population of France, but France was of a mind that you had to be all of the same religion in France. It wouldn't work if you had two different religions going on. So, so in 1572... There was a showdown, which was called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, in which the Catholic troops and Catholic leaders more or less exterminated Protestantism in France. They, they killed a lot of Huguenots. Huguenots actually fought back and killed Catholics. Eventually, the Huguenots were all either killed or mostly driven out of the country. And that's why you see a lot of French names in other countries, in the Netherlands, in parts of Germany. In England, there are a lot of French names that are from these Huguenot refugees 
um, from the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. The Reformed churches were also outlaw, but after years of war with Catholic forces, they were also granted official recognition and legalization in 1648. So it took them much longer, and that took place at the Peace of Westphalia. Now you've got three legal versions of Christianity in Europe, the Roman Catholic Church, Lutheranism, and the Reformed Churches. The emphasis of the Reformed Churches, if there was a single one, would be the sovereignty of God, meaning that God is king over all. You may have an earthly king, but the ultimate ruler, the ultimate person who's in authority, of course, is God. And that would be something that all the Reformed Churches would have emphasized. Moving on to what I think is maybe one of the most interesting of the four groups that was able to split from the Catholic Church, and that would be Anglicanism. Anglicanism, which is known in the United States as Episcopalian, originated from Henry VIII's succession dilemma. His father, Henry VII, had come to the throne under somewhat questionable circumstances. There had been a great battle of the nobles against the king, King Richard III, and Henry's father had been the leader of those rebel nobles, and they had killed the king on the battlefield, and Henry's father became the new king. Well, a lot of people didn't accept this new bunch as the royal family. This would be the Tudor family. And so Henry VII always was on his guard because a lot of people didn't believe that he was the legitimate king. Well, Henry VIII, his son, had that same, I guess you'd say, paranoia. Henry's older brother, Arthur, had been married to a powerful ally. England had constantly been, I guess you'd say, at odds with France, and so they needed a powerful ally, which at this point was Spain. Spain was this new, young, strong nation. It was finally united. It had colonies in the New World. It was massively wealthy. Hey, let's get the Spanish as our allies. And what is the best way to do that? It's by marrying an English prince to a Spanish princess. So Arthur was married to Catherine of Aragon. Well, Arthur died before his parents did. So now you, you look to the next heir. When Henry VII died, his younger son, Henry, King Henry VIII, took the throne. But you still wanted the Spanish as allies, so instead of sending Catherine home, she was married to Henry. Now, she was probably 12 years older than Henry, so it was a little bit of an odd match. But Henry was used to having whatever women he wanted anyway, and so he didn't mind marrying Catherine. But the problem was Catherine could not produce a legitimate male heir. She produced stillborn males. She produced a healthy girl, but no legitimate male. And so Henry was dead set that he wanted a legitimate male heir, so nobody would question the authenticity of the Tudor line. Well, eventually, Catherine became obviously incapable of bearing any more children, and so Henry politely asked the Pope if he would please annul his marriage to Catherine. The Pope said, no, nothing wrong with your marriage. Sorry you didn't have a male heir. That's the way the cookie crumbles. And so Henry said, okay, fine, I don't need the Pope. The Pope has no more authority over the English church. I am confiscating all Catholic property, and I'm going to set up the Archbishop of Canterbury as the head of the English church, with me as the supreme head of the English church. And so that's uh, what he did. He promptly <clears throat> married his mistress, Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn also did not produce a male heir. She produced another healthy daughter, Elizabeth. After about three years of marriage, she was accused of having an affair against Henry, and her head was removed from her body. Then there were, th there were four other wives, but finally Jane Seymour, the, th the third wife, did produce a male heir, and his name was Edward. In 1534, Henry ordered Parliament to pass a law called the Act of Supremacy which made the king and the Archbishop of Canterbury sovereign over the English church. It didn't change much in terms of the way church was done. It didn't change practice. It didn't change a lot of you know, what the church taught. It just meant that the Pope had no more authority. And as I said, Vatican property was confiscated and Catholic clergy was exiled. 
A lot of his nobles didn't want to go along with this. They wanted to remain Catholic. There was some, there were some who were very fed up, like so many other people in Europe were fed up with the Catholic Church. But there was a lot of that, a lot of nobles that wanted to stay Catholic. So to sweeten the deal, so that they would all turn Protestant, he passed out this confiscated church property to his nobles. So if there was a monastery with rich lands and fields, uh, he might give that to one of his nobles. Uh, so that they would go along with his Protestant leanings. So under Henry, not a lot changed in terms of how the church did things. It just had different leadership. But when Henry died in 1547, his son Edward VI became king. Now he was only eight years old when he assumed the throne. He lasted until he was about 17. He was never very well as, a, as an individual. And he obviously was not running the country as an eight-year-old, but his advisors were very strongly Protestant, of the, of the John Calvin type of Protestantism, very Reformed. They weren't just going along with it because it was the convenient thing to do. They really believed in Protestantism. And so they made life pretty difficult for Catholics in England and made the English church far more thoroughly Protestant. But Edward died in 1553 at age 17, so now you have a succession crisis. Well, the next heir to the throne would be Henry's oldest daughter, which would be Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. And she was passionately Catholic. Also, she eventually married the King of Spain, who was passionately Catholic. So she's not only Queen of England, she's Queen of Spain as well. She came to the throne in 1553 and attempted in her five-year reign to reintroduce Catholicism into England. And she was so violent about it by burning pastors at the stake and imprisoning Christians and, you know, making life difficult for Protestants that she earned the nickname Bloody Mary. You thought that was a drink you order in the bar? Well, the drink got its name from Queen Mary, the persecutor of Protestants. When Mary died in 1558, who do you go to? Well, you go to the only other child of Henry, which would be Elizabeth. She had spent most of her early life trying to be invisible because she was caught between her brother Edward and her sister Mary. And when she came to the throne, she immediately vowed that England was not going to go back to Catholicism. It was going to stay Protestant, but it was going to be a moderate Protestantism. It wasn't going to be as radical, as extreme as the Reformed brand that John Calvin had started. They were going to keep some practices that were sort of Catholic-like. In other words, the priest would wear robes and vestments, and there'd be candles, and, you know, it'd be a mass-like service in some ways. But their teachings and their beliefs and their philosophy would be very Protestant. And so you also had married priests, so Anglican priests can be married. Um, so if there's an emphasis, it would be moderate reform. And she also practiced a certain tolerance within Anglicanism. So realizing that not everybody was on exactly the same page every on every single issue, she allowed a certain range of tolerance for people with different beliefs, which eventually is going to spin off lots of other different Protestant groups. So many of the Protestant groups we're familiar with, like Baptists and Methodists and Quakers and some others, are spin-offs from Anglicanism, not directly from Catholicism. Moving on to the radicals, the radicals included a variety of groups in this sort of catch-all category, which left Catholicism. But the best known group were the Anabaptists. They were founded by a former priest named Conrad Grable, and they believed in complete overhauling of Christianity and solely on the New Testament. They didn't want to incorporate, incorporate many things from the Old Testament. They wanted just a New Testament church. And they didn't want any of the accumulated traditions from the Middle Ages, from the Catholic Church. They wanted to start fresh. So no priests, no vestments, no candles, no, you know, none of that sort of thing. No church holidays except for Christmas and Easter maybe. Just nothing but a very simple faith. Anabaptists had their origins as part of the Swiss Protestantism begun by the priest Ulrich Zwingli. He had been a student of Erasmus. 
By 1520, Zwingli had broken with the Roman Catholic Church and was a major factor in the conversion of Zurich and other Swiss cities to Protestantism during the 1520s, um, kind of simultaneous with Lutheranism. He tried to reconcile with Lutheranism uh, to form a united Protestantism in, in Switzerland and Germany, but uh, they couldn't agree on a couple of issues, and so they stayed separate. The Anabaptist movement was an offshoot of Zwingli's Protestant church in Switzerland and was eventually led by a former priest, Menno Siemens. His followers were known as Mennonites. And so uh, Mennonites are Anabaptists. They will tell you that they're Anabaptist Christians, but most people know them as Mennonites. They practiced, if you want to say they emphasized, gospel simplicity, pacifism, and plain living. So the Mennonites tend to live plain. Um, they tend to celebrate simple living. One of the more extreme groups among the Mennonites are the Amish, who don't believe in cars or electric devices or anything like that. So they emphasize the teachings of the New Testament. They emphasize personal conversion and baptism of believers only. Here's what the map of Europe looked like as far as religions after the Protestant Reformation got really established in the 1600s. The pink areas are Eastern Orthodox areas, so we didn't really talk about them. The yellow areas, the bright yellow areas, are Roman Catholic. The more orange areas are Lutheran. And the sort of the light green would be Anglican. And the blue and darker green would be the, the Reformed Church areas. So Scotland's a, a deep blue. Um, the Huguenot in France are the deep blue. And the, the uh, Swiss um, Mennonite people would be more the deeper green. All right, what were the Catholics doing during this time? Well, for the first number of years, they were just blown away. They didn't know what to do. They were losing much of Europe. Um, Luther had really shocked them, and Calvin had also shocked them. King Henry had shocked them. But eventually they collected themselves, and they began to reclaim territory. They began to send their own missionaries out to bring people back into the Catholic faith. And they were successful, especially in France, where they got rid of the Protestants and, and uh, reclaimed the territory and the people for Catholicism. They also convened a church council to decide what to do, Church Council met a number of times between 1545 and 1560. It was the Council of Trent. The main findings or the main outcomes of the Council of Trent are a rejection of Protestantism and the acceptance officially of the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament. They'd been using the Apocrypha. They just had never officially accepted it as part of inspired scripture. Protestants still do not accept the Apocrypha. They also founded some new religious orders. The Society of Jesus is the main one. There's also something called the Oratorio of Divine Love. But uh, the one that still exists is the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, who formed a lot of schools and training centers. Many Catholic universities are, were founded by Jesuits. The founder of the Jesuits was Ignatius Loyola, a Basque, who became a, a priest and um, founded the order. And then his, his also his lieutenant, his organizer, Francis Xavier. So what is the impact of Protestantism and how did it change Western civilization? Well, Protestantism introduced some new ways of looking at traditional religious issues. For example, here's an important question. Where does religious authority come from? Where, where do we get what we know and what we believe as Christians? I mean, that's what people were asking. Well, where does that come from? How do we know what we believe? Catholicism would say that we know what we believe because the Bible teaches it to us, but also church councils have, have laid down some teaching that's not necessarily from the Bible, but it's equally inspired. And the Pope can make statements that are just as valid and just as important as Scripture. So the Bible councils and Popes are the authorities for Catholicism. For Protestants, they said, nope, just the Bible, sola scriptura, the Bible alone, these other things maybe have some wisdom, but they don't hold the same weight and authority that Scripture does. Here's another important basic question for Christians. 
How is a person saved? How do you get in your life the benefits of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection from the grave? How, how does a person get that? The Christian church teaches that, but how do you get it? In Catholicism, they would say that that is received by the person that becomes effective in a person's life by faith in Christ through participation in the sacraments. So baptism, Holy Communion, you know, all of those kinds of things. Marriage, if you're going to be married or you know, entering holy orders, if you're not, you know, all of those seven sacraments, that they're, they're the way that your faith takes shape in your life. Protestants would say, no, no, it's faith alone. It is the act of the will in choosing to follow Jesus Christ that saves a person, that that's what saves you. And that alone, that sacraments may be helpful, but they're not, they're not, they don't save. They're not salvific. Here's another question. Who may approach God? Who gets to talk to God directly? In Catholicism, they would say that the average person has to speak to God, has to communicate to God through ordained clergy. So you need someone between you and God who can talk for you. And that's why you need the priest. In Protestantism, they would say any true Christian can speak to God directly. It's, it's just that you don't need a, a priest. You, you can have a pastor who may be helpful as an advisor, as a teacher, but the pastor is not someone who is a mediator, an intermediary between you and God. So that's a different answer than had been accepted for centuries in the Middle Ages. What does true Christian living look like? What does it look like to live an authentic Christian life? Well, in Catholicism up to that time, it had been, well, you need if you're really going to devote yourself, you need to be a priest or a monk or a nun. Protestants would say, no, any honorable vocation, any honorable life lived for Jesus is an authentic Christian life. So obviously there are some things you would do with your life that wouldn't be authentic Christian living. And you can think of some of those, I'm sure. But if you're living a normal life, doing almost any kind of normal job, if your heart is in it serving God, then that's an authentic Christian life. You don't have to have special religious credentials to do that. All right, that's Protestantism. And you can already tell what a great difference that's going to make in the direction of Western civilization. From this point on, there is going to be a, at least for a period of time, there's going to be a Catholic stream of Western civilization that will look at art and philosophy and beauty and living very differently than the Protestant stream will do. And we'll see that especially in this next period called the Baroque.